It's a strange feeling to be giving this talk just over a week after Mary Midgley's death. Uh, there's nothing tragic about the death of someone who lived so vibrantly and so long. And Mary herself argued in one of her essays that immortality in this life would be bad for us. We are animals, she said, the significance of whose lives lies in part in the fact that we succeed one another. Still, her death, just as this series was about to commence, feels like a door swinging shut between the world she and her friends inhabited and our own. I miss her already, and so I want to dedicate my remarks this evening to her memory particularly. I've got two aims this evening. By the end, I will have suggested an interpretation of the ethical thought of Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote, Mary Midgley, and Iris Murdoch, an interpretation on which they can be seen as contributing in different ways to a common project. It was a project that emerged out of their several efforts over time and probably couldn't have been fully anticipated in advance. I don't want to set anyone up for disappointment. This isn't going to be a theoretical talk, mostly. Rather, it will be a narrative account of how each of these women contributed to making a kind of naturalistic defense of ethical objectivity more credible than it was before. Much of what I'll be doing then is explaining how each of these four came to make the particular contribution she did toward their implicit common project. I'll be exploring how these women were prepared to perceive possibilities that their male contemporaries mostly did not. You might think of this then, and this is what I was asked to do by Professor O'Hare, uh, as a kind of fanfare for the marvelous series that's been laid out for the coming months. Anscombe, Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch were born within 18 months of one another as part of a modest baby boom that followed the First World War. So, all born just after the Great War, these women consequently reached university age just at the verge of the next. All four were accepted at Oxford, which was then the destination of choice for any talented and ambitious young woman in the far-flung British Empire. Oxford, unlike Cambridge, granted degrees to women. At the same time, lingering anxieties about the place of women at the university had led to a freeze on the number of women who could be admitted each year to Oxford's four women's colleges. The upshot was women from Great Britain and the rest of the empire who sought the distinction of an Oxbridge education and a degree were in competition with one another for about 200 places a year. For all that concentration of talent, women who came to study at Oxford did suffer some deficits relative to their male peers. The most distinguished and best resourced public schools, Eton, Rugby, Winchester, were male only. And these schools were particularly strong and schools open to women comparatively weak in classical languages, the subject area that prepared one for the standard philosophy curriculum at Oxford, greats, opening with two years of classical literature and history before turning to pre-modern and modern philosophy. There's almost a parable here about the subtle ways in which gatekeeping works. You tacitly suppose, maybe you even tell yourself, that you're just insisting on baseline competence and some relevant subjects on some good, helpful background. And there's no in-principle reason why any kind of person might not have that background. But in fact, given the way the world happens to be, you're cutting off opportunities for people who might be capable of impressive work if only there were a path open to them that didn't impose these particular conditions. Novelist Nina Bauden, who read Modern Greats, that is philosophy, politics, and economics, a few years later, found that even in that concentration, explicitly designed for students interested in the kind of broad-based education that Greats provided, but who hadn't seriously studied Greek, her philosophy tutor didn't know where to begin with her. She wrote, he'd not taught girls before, nor any student of either sex from a state grammar school, and could not believe I had never learned Greek. He seemed convinced that I must be concealing this simple, fundamental skill out of some mysterious modesty. Foote, like Bauden, read modern greats. Her pre-undergraduate education was typical for an upper-class girl of her time. Supplied by a shifting series of governesses, 
and centering on comportment and other minor accomplishments supplemented with whatever bits of history, mathematics, and the like that a particular governess happened to know and chose to emphasize. Foote only ended up at Oxford because a particularly good governess, near the end of her teenage years, saw the capacity in her and encouraged her to fill in the gaps in her education with correspondence courses and then apply. Foote told a story to Peter Conradi about overhearing her mother lament to a friend that her daughter was pursuing something as common as a university education. Never mind, dear, the friend consoled her mother. She doesn't look clever. So greats was out of the question for Foote, but Anscombe, Midgley, and Murdoch, each middle class, each more comprehensively educated, all read greats. Anscombe was a special case in this regard, as in so many others. Her mother had been a school teacher and had started her children on, greats at a young, on Greek sorry, at a young age, though they attended a suburban high school of no distinction. Anscombe and her brothers were reading Plato in the original before university. But when Midgley and Murdoch were admitted, they were told they needed to do remedial language study and spent the year before going up cramming. Even then, they were never going to achieve the easy competence of someone who had been doing translations and verse compositions from age 11. But they were better prepared in other ways, maybe precisely because they'd been less cloistered in a world of privilege. The time that a public school curriculum might have given to Greek, they'd spent on history, literature, and politics. Midgley tells a story in her memoir about a seminar she and Murdoch took on Aeschylus' Agamemnon. She was assigned to a working group with Murdoch and a male peer. She and Murdoch were struck by, quote, how much better equipped he was about the language and how much less idea he had of the point of what was being said. When the storm clouds that had been looming over, looming over Europe finally broke with Hitler's invasion of Czechoslovakia, many of Oxford's young men enlisted straight away even before conscription began in 39. Until several years into the war, though, women were encouraged to complete their educations so they could fill white-collar positions in the government and elsewhere that were being vacated by men. In the meantime, they filled another kind of vacated position as the preferred protégés of their remaining professors. No one should wish for a war. But the effect of the depopulation of the university on the kind of attention given to these women was profound. Midgley recalled, quote, the effect was to make it a great deal easier for a woman to be heard in discussion than it is in normal times. Sheer loudness of voice has a lot to do with the difficulty, but there's also a temperamental difference about confidence, about the amount of work that one thinks is needed to make one's opinion worth hearing, end quote. Anscombe, again, was an outlier. The most intimidating, intimidatingly brilliant of the four, she'd been bound for a career in philosophy from well before she went up. As a high schooler, she'd been puzzling already about problems in the metaphysics of causation that would occupy her right to her inaugural lecture at Cambridge. As I already mentioned, she suffered no deficit of preparation in classical languages and was held back only a little in greats because she couldn't be bothered to invest effort in any aspect of the curriculum that wasn't at the center of her concerns. There are wonderful stories about her viva on this, uh, on this matter. But for the other three, mentoring made all the difference. And not just any mentor would have sufficed. It wasn't just that, as women, they didn't fit the preconceived image of a philosopher in the minds of some potential mentors, maybe even in their own. Someone with a deeper, more carrying voice, someone whose style and discussion was more stereotypically masculine, someone with flawless Greek. It was also that the kind of philosophy in fashion at that moment was apt to repel capable students who didn't already think of themselves as philosophers and whose interests ran, like those of many young people in those unsettled times, toward ethics and politics. It took a mentor accustomed to thinking untimely and unconventional thoughts both to recognize and encourage their potential and to offer them a model of philosophizing different from the prevailing one. What was the prevailing model? It was the logical empiricism or positivism, particularly associated with the group of Viennese intellectuals calling themselves the Vienna Circle and popularized in Britain by the brash, attention-seeking young Don A.J. Ayer. In 1935, Ayer published an improbable book a philosophical bestseller, Language, Truth, and Logic. The book was a sensation, drawing praise and denunciation in the academic and popular press alike. 
It was an attack on virtually all philosophy that had ever been written. The opening sentence lays down the challenge. Quote, the traditional disputes of philosophers are for the most part as unwarranted as they are unfruitful. The reason, Ayer said, is that philosophers have not policed their language, have not made sure that their utterances, in particular their declarative utterances, their statements, are meaningful. And what kinds of statements are meaningful? Just two. Statements about the world that can be confirmed or disconfirmed by observation, and statements about the governing principles of our language, syntax, and semantics. There are statements of fact, open in principle to verification or falsification by experience. There are statements defining words or laying out other conventions for their use. There are some derivative cases like interrogatives. And all else is sound and fury. There are many problems with Ayer's view, some of which he came to recognize. For one, do Ayer's statements about what sorts of statements are meaningful pass reflexively the very test they apply to other statements? But no matter, it's the legacy of Ayer's view that concerns us here, particularly in ethics. The conclusion Ayer drew about ethical discourse was that it's largely meaningless. It merely expresses the approval or disapproval of the speaker. As Ayer wrote in his sixth chapter, quote, if I say stealing money is wrong, I produce a sentence which has no factual meaning. That is, expresses no proposition which can be either true or false. It is as if I had written, stealing money, double exclamation marks, where the shape and thickness of the exclamation marks show by a suitable convention that a special sort of moral disapproval is being expressed. Ayer's view helped codify a dichotomy that had been emerging since the early modern period, a dichotomy between facts and values. According to this dichotomy, values are human projections onto a value-free reality. So it's not the case that we should try to conform our evaluative attitudes and judgments to an independent reality. Fact, the term contrasting with value in this dichotomy, is in its way equally expressive of the conception. What can reality be but the sum total of the facts? And what's left after one has accounted for the facts? Nothing real only various subjective attitudes that one might take up toward the facts, with no need to fear that one could be wrong. Ayer self-consciously embraced this view, drew out its implications, and gave it powerful articulation. He, more than anyone, set the context in which Anscombe, Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch began reflecting philosophically about ethics. He set them their task. He rendered suspect or invisible, virtually all pre-modern ethical reflection, which didn't distinguish fact and value in this way. For an extended period, before and after the war, philosophers developed their theories explicitly in response to Ayer. There was no way of avoiding the challenge. In a letter to Foote, shortly after graduation, Murdoch wrote that she was looking ahead and contemplating the significance of life, but added glibly that, of course, such expressions were meaningless. Air was in the air. As Murdoch's letter illustrates, the effect of Ayer's work was destructive. It didn't help people think about questions like what to do with their lives, questions they were bound to reflect on regardless. It undercut such thinking. As Murdoch would later recognize, Ayer's work did imply an ideal. It glamorized a kind of disillusioned toughness that faced up to a world in which words like good have no meaning. But that was not the life wisdom that Murdoch and her friends sought. Philosophy was salvaged for Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch when they were assigned to theologian philosopher Donald MacKinnon as their tutor. More famous now in theological circles, he was the tutor of uh, Archbishop Williams, uh, Donald MacKinnon uh, was a philosopher before he was a theologian. He was evidently one of the most impressive intellects of his generation. On joining the philosophy subfaculty of Oxford in the mid-30s, the hulking Scotsman was promptly invited to join the Brethren, a small coterie convened by the top young philosophers at the university, including Ayer, Isaiah Berlin, and J.L. Austin. MacKinnon was interested in the whole history of philosophy. He taught his students to engage seriously with figures Ayer was encouraging readers to dismiss. But as shown by his involvement with the Brethren, he also kept current on contemporary philosophy 
and took seriously Ayer's charge that his own areas of concern, ethics and theology, were groundless speculation, even meaningless. When McKinnon is not remembered for these things, his brilliance, his preoccupation with the special challenges to ethics and theology in late modernity, he's remembered as a tormented eccentric, a man who chewed pencils to splinters or gnawed lumps of coal as his students read out their essays. Midgley writes, quote, McKinnon often made strange, unpredictable movements, and in particular, strange grimaces, which seemed to express profound anguish. A lot of the stories about him are true enough. He did wave pokers and other things about in an alarming way. He did lie on the floor or beat the wall violently. He was prone to long silences, sometimes not seeming to hear at all what was said to him. If McKinnon suffered from a condition like Tourette's, as Midgley speculates, it may have been exasperated in those days when, disqualified from military service, he threw himself into teaching as if to justify his own existence, wearing himself out, taking on as many students as would ordinarily be divided among three or more tutors. McKinnon could be intimidating on first acquaintance, but he also inspired devotion by his intelligence and insight, by the generosity of attention he lavished on students, by the depth of his engagement with both the material he taught and the crises of the time. The effects of his instruction were transformative. By the end of their undergraduate years, Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch were all considering philosophy as a path. Foote later described McKinnon as holy and as having created her, this from a committed atheist. For her part, in 1945, Murdoch wrote about McKinnon, after meeting him, one really understands how those people at Galilee got up and followed without any hesitation. Under McKinnon's mentorship, Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch were becoming the kind of philosophers who would turn to out-of-fashion figures in the history of philosophy for light, and whose aim in philosophy was to reflect on what Ayer would have regarded as the meaningless question of the best life for a human to live. Once again, on both points, Anscombe was there ahead of her friends. She had converted to Catholicism as a teenager, defying her parents. Her parents didn't believe in anything in particular, but were determined that if their daughter was going to become religious, she should at least do it in a conventional way, C of E. They called in a priest to sort her out. Anscombe promptly buttonholed the poor man. Do you think the bread is the body of Christ? The priest hemmed and hawed, said it was a difficult question, shrouded in mystery. Anscombe was unimpressed. Well, I do. She was not only a born philosopher, she was a born contrarian. And her Catholicism prompted her to take seriously questions about the best life for humans and to look for instruction to figures like Thomas Aquinas, deeply out of fashion. The presence of Anscombe in Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch's life and the awe with which they regarded her further bolstered their sense that there was another way besides Ayers. When did they first set themselves against Ayers' vision? It's hard to know. Late in life, Foote gave a number of interviews in which she identified the day on which she first thought that she had to do ethics in a way that defied Ayer's strictures. She was at the cinema for the newsreels in April 1945, the day they showed the liberation of the Belsen and Buchenwald camps. The piles of bodies, the emaciated survivors pressed against the fence. Like many of her contemporaries, Foote emerged from the cinema catatonic with shock. From the moment she saw those images, she said, she was committed to the idea that Ayer was mistaken. How, she didn't know yet. But he was. He had to be. The people who had run those camps didn't merely approve of things that she disapproved. Rather, they were terribly, monstrously wrong. We must note, though, there was another way to react to the war a way that revised but did not repudiate Ayer's view, and it was not the reaction of people who hadn't faced real horror. R.M. Hare would become the principal professional antagonist to the women I'm discussing. Ayer's views on ethics were crude, but more sophisticated versions of these views were developed over the ensuing decade that addressed the problems with Ayer's view from within his basic world picture. Hare was foremost among the improvers. Cantankerous and profoundly earnest, he stood for everything philosophically that Foote and her friends came to reject. He too was born in 1919, just three days after Anscombe, and went up to Balliol 
a couple of years before the war, as she did. In 38, when it had become clear that war was coming, Hare gave himself 24 hours to sort out whether he was a pacifist. After a hard night of reflection, he enlisted. He was sent to East Asia, where he spent a happy year teaching Punjabi soldiers to operate British military equipment before the fall of Singapore, which plunged his life into darkness. After a couple of years in a prison camp, he was sent off to work on the Burma Railway. Between a quarter and a half of his fellow prisoners died from day after day of hauling dirt on starvation rations. Hare didn't die. He kept himself alive and sane, in part by doing philosophy. He stole an accounting ledger early on from a guard shack and kept it hidden for three years, writing out his life philosophy with any stylus he could manufacture and any time he could scrounge. For instance, when he was judged unfit for work with dysentery. When Hare was released after the war, he judged that his book wasn't any good, a judgment he seems to have formed under the influence of Ayer's positivism. It's too bad because the book is terrifically interesting, but very metaphysical as Ayer would have said. The main lessons Hare took away from the war and brought with him to the rest of his career were these. First, there's no reasoning with some people. There was no arguing with his taskmasters on the Burma Railway. Past a certain point, reasoning about how to live is futile, not merely because people can always refuse to listen, but because past a certain point, there's nothing more to be said. A person chooses a way of living explicitly or implicitly, and that's that. Second, and relatedly, if there's any rational necessity in ethics, it's just this necessity of choosing a way of life, or a set of principles, as Hare spoke of it. Some people do this with more inner strength and clarity of vision. Some merely fall into a way of life that they never articulate to themselves. But we all live out some principles, whether we recognize them and own up to them or not. And here's the link to air. There are no facts that dictate which principles we ought to adopt we must each simply decide what to live for. Hare was generalizing from his own experience. He had enlisted by an act of reflective self-commitment. He had kept himself alive and whole by a further act of commitment. Those familiar with the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre will see, as Murdoch would, affinities between his ideas and Hare's. At the end of the war, Hare returned, like many, to complete his degree. The influx of ex-servicemen, the slow clearing backlog of people pursuing educations they'd had to postpone, and then another baby boom, meant that for a generation there were jobs for most would-be dons. In the second half of the 40s, Anscombe and Foote both secured research fellowships and some limited teaching at Somerville. Murdoch was a train ride away at Cambridge doing graduate work, and then landed a position at St. Anne's. Midgley did graduate work at Oxford, which she then abandoned in favor of a job at Reading. Notwithstanding various entrenched, half-conscious prejudices, the kind reflected in small things, like a discussion group for rising young philosophers calling itself the Brethren, they were all on their way to being professionally established by the end of the 40s. Nevertheless, all of them, except maybe Foote, would remain in one way or another outsiders their whole careers. Up to this point, I've been talking about how Anscombe, Foote, Midgley, and Murdoch became interested in philosophy and were prepared for the contributions they would later make. I've been giving background. In the second part, slightly longer, of this evening's lecture, as pledged, I'm going to sketch the implicit common project I see in the work of these four women, a project with ongoing relevance to the current philosophical scene, though I won't have a time to develop that much, and to late modern Western culture generally. Again, though, I'll continue to give my remarks narrative form because the project I wish to highlight was an unfolding one, not something these women conceived one day in the late 40s in a tea shop. This shouldn't surprise us because what they eventually accomplished involved an imaginative leap outside the strictures endorsed by their contemporaries and predecessors. Maybe some imaginative leaps come all at once, fully formed. More commonly, though, as Thomas Kuhn describes in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, people first raise new questions about some dominant framing, freeing people to consider that there might be something else, that the dominant framing could be wrong. Later, people begin to try out in the sketchiest way possible alternatives, or perhaps they just try out elements of such alternatives, 
Only then does it become possible to develop these. The leap outside the fact-value dichotomy was that kind of leap. Surely it helped, though, that the people who pursued it were themselves insider-outsiders and had each been mentored by an insider-outsider, Wittgenstein in Anscombe's case. They had learned to engage current scholarship. They'd also learned, though, to engage old-fashioned thoughts and topics and authors that no late modern person was supposed to take seriously anymore. Murdoch was in some ways the furthest outside of the four, though it depends what sort of outsideness we have in mind. Her outsideness positioned her to make a contribution that none of her friends, I think, could have, diagnosing the several theories of ethics that they were concerned to reject. When I say Murdoch diagnosed these theories, I mean she identified them as symptoms of something deeper, an underlying cultural condition or outlook. She identified the unexpressed and peculiarly late modern ideals behind a set of theories that were standardly presented as timeless, value-neutral analyses of moral thought and discourse. This was crucial, I think, if she and her friends were to think sufficiently radically about what to put in place of such theories. If you don't perceive what's motivating mistake, especially if you carry that motive within yourself like latent malaria, you're apt to keep making the mistake. Murdoch aspired already by the mid-40s to be a novelist as well as a philosopher and to be part of the international community of writers and public intellectuals. She'd always had a facility for languages and kept acquiring them throughout her life. What Murdoch spotted, thanks to her voracious and diverse reading, was this kinship between French existentialism on the one hand and the thought of British philosophers like Ayer and Hare on the other. If neither group was reading the other much, but they were coming to very similar conclusions, however masked by different philosophical vocabularies, Murdoch saw that as suggestive of an underlying intellectual or even spiritual condition. I mentioned in passing the kinship between the thought of Sartre and the thought of Hare. No one had spotted this before Murdoch and thus thought to go further and ask what lay behind it. At one level, the answer is plain enough. Ayer, Sartre, Hare, all adhere to the late modern world picture I described earlier. There are facts, there are values, and values aren't facts. They're subjective attitudes people take up toward facts. If that's just a discovery, then perhaps there's little more to say. Different groups of scholars converged on the same truth. But if one is troubled by the limitations of this picture, what it doesn't allow one to say about the Nazis, and if one wonders what could take its place, then it's worth retaining one's curiosity and digging deeper. First, if one's going to try to think one's way around or outside this picture, it's helpful to recognize it as late modern, as culturally and historically local. One can then ask whether there are credible alternatives available, perhaps from other times and places. Second, it's helpful to recognize that the picture at least in the way it's usually presented and motivated, is not fully self-consistent. It, or its advocates, make the picture much more drawing than it would otherwise be by connecting it with an ideal, the objective validity of which they overtly disav disavow. According to the picture, ideals are just projections, none more objectively valid than another. But invariably, Murdoch noted, the picture is motivated significantly even given an atmosphere of spiritual grandeur by the tacit, unscrutinized invocation of tropes of 19th century romanticism, specifically the romantic sublime. It is exhilarating, exalting, to stare into the abyss, into the icy valuelessness of it all, and not flinch. To summon the courage and honesty to stare down the cold truth, like Hector's defiance of his fate in the Iliad, this is noble. On the premises of the view in question, such talk of nobility, or in British authors like Hare, more commonly of facing the facts like an adult, like a man, this should count as but one more arbitrary projection. But with all the cultural force of deeply internalized romanticism behind it, it's presented as if it were what the view explicitly disallows, an objectively valid ideal. Of course we should be honest and tough and face facts. The seeming gloom of the existentialist is superficial, Murdoch writes. It, quote, conceals elation. For one is among the elect who get it, 
who are man enough to face the truth. To recognize these attitudes and outlooks as culturally peculiar, to be given permission even to laugh at their pretension, is to be in a much stronger position to begin thinking about alternatives. This, above all, was Murdoch's contribution, beginning with the pair of radio addresses at the turn of the 1950s that grew into her first book, tellingly titled Sartre, Romantic Rationalist. Murdoch left her position at St. Anne's by the early 60s, ostensibly to focus on her fiction, but also because she'd concluded that what she did wasn't really philosophy. If she alone could have offered her diagnosis, offering it nevertheless served to marginalize her from the academic community to which she belonged. For in Oxford, under the influence of Austen, an inspiring but narrow conception of philosophical method had by the early 50s come to dominate. Austen's method had roots both in the patient textual scholarship of an excellent classics tutor and in his wartime experiences at Bletchley Park sifting intelligence. Working collaboratively with his male junior colleagues, whom he convened each Saturday morning during term time, he tried to get as clear as possible about subtle differences among clusters of topically related words, hounding down the minutiae, as he called it. Austin was determined to make progress in philosophy and surveying the wreckage of philosophical history, all the grand systems constructed, then abandoned, he renounced system building. Or at any rate, he determined the only way to build was extremely slowly, piece by piece, scrutinizing our words and through them our concepts. Under his influence, a whole generation of Oxford philosophers came to share his impatience with generalization and synthesis his intellectual aesthetic of clarity and cleanliness. Words are our tools, he wrote, and we should use clean tools. It's not difficult to see the attractions of Austin's approach, the painstaking carefulness, the ideal of getting something right, even if it's nothing grand. I remember my undergraduate mentor, uh, Richard Hare's son, John, saying to me, it is so hard to say anything true. It's like an echo of Austin. <laughs> Uh, but in a context obsessed with that ideal, Murdoch's eclectic, elusive essays, concerned with big, competing visions of the world and the human condition, were bound to appear merely sloppy. Murdoch inspired those close to her with her insight and range of reference, but her philosophical writing was less and less appreciated in Oxford as the 50s wore on. People regarded her as a helpful expert on a minor subject, contemporary French thought. Hare's remarks on French existentialism to Ved Mehta are telling, quote, the thing wrong with the existentialists and the other continental philosophers is that they haven't had their noses rubbed in the necessity of saying exactly what they mean, end quote. Murdoch's work didn't register in her milieu as being properly disciplined, properly philosophical. Berlin, who adulated Austin, he had a sign that he'd gotten from a repair shop uh, sitting on his desk like a memento mori that said, Austin. Uh, Berlin quipped about Murdoch that she was, quote, a lady not known for the clarity of her views. There's something terribly sad about that remark, as Berlin himself was filled with self-doubt on account of the similarly historical and visionary qualities of his own best work. He didn't think what he did was real philosophy either, because real philosophy meant to him what Austin did. One has to wonder whether Murdoch's increasing detachment from philosophy, perhaps even her curious but vigorous insistence that there's little connection between her novels and philosophical writings, reflects a similar internalization of a communal judgment that what she did, even if it went under the banner of philosophy, didn't really merit the name. Murdoch was inspiring to her friends. She and Foote were, by the mid-50s, co-teaching with Basil Mitchell a graduate course on the ancient ethical vocabulary of virtue and vice, but she was marginalized within the philosophical community. So what, you might wonder, did it take to get the attention of that community, to get it to begin reconsidering its dominant ways of thinking about ethics? A frontal assault. As I've noted, Anscombe was acknowledged by her circle of friends as the most brilliant of them. This compensated for the fact that she was socially even more of an outsider than Murdoch. Murdoch was personally magnetic, someone who always had more devoted friends and admirers than time to give them. By contrast, Anscombe, at once pugnacious and shy, physically awkward, 
famously oblivious to proprieties of dress and speech, if she hadn't awed everyone around her intellectually, life in Oxford might have been intolerable for her. From the mid-40s, she and Foote were both somewhat tenuously hired on at Somerville, which really had work for only one philosophy tutor, but kept finding fellowships for them both, mostly for Anscombe, so as to postpone the day when it had to choose and let one of them go. There was one frightening moment in the 50s when Foote offered privately to resign rather than let them let go of Anscombe, and they found a way. Despite a workload to rival McKinnon's in the early 40s, Foote made time daily to, in effect, apprentice herself to Anscombe. And Anscombe herself evidently regarded these afternoon discussions as important enough to go on making time for them. We should note that she had more than enough to do, too. From the mid-40s through the mid-60s, she always had small children at home. And her husband, Peter Geach, lived and taught several hours away in Birmingham. For Anscombe to take time daily for Foote in this context is impressive. Foote, for her part, had found an object of intellectual devotion such as she'd had before in McKinnon. She describes their conversations memorably, quote, it was like in those old children's comics where a steamroller runs over a character who becomes flattened, an outline on the ground, but is there all right in the next episode. The key to Anscombe's character, I think, is not combativeness as such, for she was not always combative. She once characterized herself as torn by a sewa indignatio. The reference to Jonathan Swift, from whose epitaph the expression is taken, is apt. Like Swift, Anscombe felt herself frequently, painfully out of step with the world around her. And as with Swift, the things that made Anscombe feel this way were the world's cozy accommodations with what she regarded as terrible evils. Being shy, and being busy translating Wittgenstein, she mostly avoided public controversy through the early 50s. Until the spring of 1956, when she undertook to oppose the nomination of former US President Harry Truman for an honorary degree from Oxford. As an undergraduate, Anscombe had co-authored and published a short pamphlet on the traditional doctrine of just war, a piece notable for its prediction that the Allies would descend eventually to direct attacks on civilians. This, she said, could not be squared with the traditional criteria of use in bello, which required that only just means be used to prosecute a war. Direct attacks on civilians, she noted, are not a just means. Direct attacks on civilians are direct attacks on the innocent i.e. murder. It was the same objection she would press against Truman's degree a decade and a half later. Anscombe's protest became a minor international news item. It was unsuccessful. She rose to speak in congregation, the potentially enormous but usually sparsely attended assembly of faculty and alumni with the authority to grant or withhold such degrees and denounced the nomination. One quote that survives from reports of her speech if you do this, she asked, what Nero, what Genghis Khan, what Hitler, or what Stalin will not be honored in the future? End quote. But the university administration, fearing institutional embarrassment, solicited everyone it could to show up and vote for the honor. The women are up to something, some were told. We have to go and vote them down. What infuriated Anscombe most were the justifications her colleagues offered, showing either that they believed it all right to attack civilians, or that they cared more about losing face than about murder. Anscombe had not until 1956 published anything on ethics, aside from the undergraduate pamphlet. She had some secondhand awareness of recent developments in ethical theory, theory surely, from her daily discussions with Foote, but her energies had been mostly absorbed for a half decade in her work as Wittgenstein's literary executor and his principal translator. Recall, too, as I said, right back to her undergraduate days, Anscombe had been selectively attentive to what people thought she ought to study. As it happened, though, at the same time the university was preparing to honor Truman, and Anscombe was asking herself why, quote, so many Oxford people should be willing to flatter such a man, end quote, Foote went on sabbatical. Anscombe took up some of her colleagues' usual responsibilities, including tutorials in ethics. These two experiences, the Truman protest and the new reading she was doing in preparation for tutorials converged in Anscombe's mind. Quote, I get some small light, she wrote, when I consider the productions of Oxford moral philosophy since the First World War, which I have lately had occasion to read, end quote. <laughs> 
none of the prevailing theories she found categorically excluded the killing of the innocent. That is, excluded murder. None of them, indeed, categorically excluded anything. They were consequentialist, in a term she coined on the spot. This was as much as to say none of them had room for Anscombe's own deepest ethical conviction that, quote, we have to fear God and keep his commandments and calculate what is for the best only within the limits of obedience, end quote. She put in a paragraph about this at the end of her pamphlet. The result was, a month later, a short note arrived from the BBC Talks Department asking if Anscombe might, quote, develop the theme of the relevance of Oxford philosophy to situations such as the one which inspired your pamphlet. End quote. A light with Swiftian indignation, she agreed. And so, on a windy evening in late January of 57, Anscombe appeared at Broadcasting House to record, in her famously soft, sweet voice, a work of biting irony, titled Oxford Moral Philosophy, Does It Corrupt the Youth? Here's the gist. To make the charge stick, that hair and others corrupt the youth, you'd have to show that the youth would have turned out better without their influence. But look, the youth had been raised in a culture that was perfectly okay with massacring Japanese civilians. So how could one maintain that Hare's philosophy corrupts anyone, just because it offers no resources for critiquing such atrocities? Maybe useless for making anybody better, but... The irony was subtle enough that her producer first mistook the script for, quote, a vigorous defense of Oxford morals and moralists. That was in the Radio Times. And urged that she quote people who thought Oxford moral philosophy was corrupting. But when the piece broadcast in early February and appeared then in The Listener, its targets understood it well enough. Two of them, Hare and P.H. Noel Smith, each had letters to the editor in the next issue, filling a tabloid column apiece. Anscombe, who loved to fight when it was on, replied, quote, I was glad to read Mr. Hare's letter and Mr. Noel Smith's. They show that what I want to go for is really there, end quote. The correspondence lasted into April, generating more heat than light. Meanwhile, though, delighted with the tempest she had stirred, Anscombe drafted a follow-up talk to be titled Principles. and was outraged when it was rejected as being too personal. From the correspondence between her and her producer, T.S. Gregory, we learned some fascinating things about the content of the abortive second talk. Her producer wrote, for instance, quote, you say that anyone can do anything on principle, and if you have a large enough stock of principles, you can select as you please the one to justify the particular wrongdoing you favor, end quote. What's fascinating about that is how closely it mirrors some things Anscombe went on to publish the next year in perhaps the most famous article she ever wrote, Modern Moral Philosophy, published in the Royal Institute's journal. It's an odd article, as anyone who's read it can attest, full of delicious or infuriating hit-and-run remarks about a variety of historical and contemporary figures. It reads a bit like a broadcast talk in parts. Given that Anscombe published extremely little in moral philosophy over her career, I think we might have the skittishness of the BBC Talks Department to thank for the existence of one of the most quoted articles of the last century. What did Anscombe say therein? She offers a Murdochian diagnosis of the ethical theories of her contemporaries and their predecessors, and recommends that the whole project of moral philosophy, as it has been conceived since the early modern period, be abandoned in favor of an effort to reappropriate the pre-modern approach of Aristotle and Aquinas, starting with their philosophical psychology. Anscombe herself, having unburdened herself on the subject in the article and in her short but no less influential book, Intention, returned to her preferred scholarly projects, like a commentary on Wittgenstein's Tractatus. She told her daughter once if there was one thing she was going to be remembered for, she would like it to be the commentary on the Tractatus. But with the appearance of modern moral philosophy, a path forward in ethics began to come clear, particularly for Foote and Midgley. Foote came first. Her contribute to the implicit shared project we've been seeing emerge was to domesticate Anscombe's radical proposals, turning them into a standard philosophical research program. Foote took Anscombe's suggestion that philosophers return to the pre-modern conceptual vocabulary of virtue and vice and extracted it from Anscombe's own caustic and enigmatic presentation recasting it in the form of a series of measured, witty, highly professionalized journal articles. 
first pointing out some difficulties with Hare's theory, taken simply as linguistic analysis, then elaborating the pre-modern alternative she and her friends had been discussing for a number of years and that Anscombe had finally made unignorable. In so doing, Foote made it possible for others, including more conventional and careful philosophers, cautious ones, to begin contributing to the work. Putting it in Kuhn's terms, Foote turned the revolutionary science of Murdoch and Anscombe into normal science. Philosophers tend to associate Anscombe and Foote's ethical outlook with Aristotle more than any other figure. But Aquinas was arguably more important in helping frame their contributions. Anscombe knew the writings of Aquinas, Aristotle's leading medieval interpreter, as well as any Aquinas scholar of the 20th century. Perhaps her most important substantive contribution to Foote's work was her suggestion to Foote during that fateful sabbatical that she read Aquinas. Since Foote took everything Anscombe said deadly seriously, she began reading, reading in particular the Secunda Secunde of the Summa Theologica, where Aquinas discusses particular virtues and vices in detail. The revelation in these works to Foote was of how ethics could be objective the result she'd been seeking since 45. Each virtue is praised because of how it assists humans in the performance of their characteristic activities. Each vice is condemned, one of her favorite examples from Aquinas was loquaciousness, because of how it inhibits humans in the performance of their characteristic activities. Reading this, she knew at last what she wanted to say, not just to hair, but to a kind of Nietzschean skeptic that she addressed in every piece of general moral philosophy she wrote from then on. I was glancing at the issue of the Institute's journal uh, about uh, a modern moral philosophy uh, that contained Foote's final lecture, and she's talking about Nietzsche right in there. One could summarize Foote's developed position thus. Hare's theory does not enable one to reply effectively to Nietzsche. Atomistic theory does. As she concluded a BBC broadcast in 1957, quote, we should be able to turn to the moral philosopher for an account of the basis of the different kinds of virtues and vices, for their necessary connection with human harm and good. This is just the sort of work that he should be able to do. But usually we are fobbed off with talk about the favorable attitude, which anyone who calls anything a virtue must take up, as if this were enough, end quote. With that broadcast, with a paper at the Oxford Philosophical Society and with two other widely discussed papers that came out of those preparatory exercises, Foote came into her reputation as Hare's foremost opponent. For the next decade, students who loved to see their teachers argue would attend the lectures and seminars of each and try out the objections of the other. Foote's reputation was richly deserved and she thereby achieved something at once vitally important and gently ironic. In her picking up Anscombe's attack on Oxford moral philosophers, she became an Oxford moral philosopher. It was Foote that Hare approached in 1958 with the idea of teaching a course together. Foote had become, in some ways, very like Austin. There was more than a passing resemblance between Austin's work and Foote's criticisms of Hare, that moral language was, rich, was richer, more complex than Hare's theory allowed. As Foote said in the BBC talk, quote, those who accuse present-day philosophers of fiddling their time away may be surprised at the suggestion that what we need is more detail, more attention to the meaning of moral terms, but this may well be the case." End quote. Foote's criticism was more effective than Anscombe's in opening up conversation because she was so respectable, so au courant, even in rebellion. If any of these women was an insider, then it was Foote. This was, of course, a role to which she'd been raised. If she was in lifelong flight from the class consciousness with which she'd grown up, she was also profoundly shaped by it. Her thoroughgoing and instinctive respectability both enabled her to achieve things that her friends could not and also burdened and occasionally blinkered her. Trivially, amusingly, her philosophical writings feature lots of examples and expressions drawn from etiquette and writing to hounds. More seriously, and uncomfortably, Foote reflexively classed and ranked philosophers, including her friends. Anscombe was first, she was next, followed by Murdoch and Midgley. 
She dedicated Virtues and Vices to Murdoch, her dearest friend, closer than Anscombe. But Murdoch doesn't appear in the index. About Midgley, Foote later remarked, quote, her mind doesn't quite work like most straight Oxford analytic philosophers. I think she found her fort being witty and sane on television, end quote. And when she went to UCLA in the mid-70s, she began to gather around her a group of colleagues and students whom she regarded and sometimes spoke of as the right sort. As I say, Foote was in flight from this class consciousness her whole adult life. There's a wonderful and telling moment in a late interview with an Oxfam representative when she refers to Lady Mary Murray and then comments, if you're called Lady Mary somebody, you've got to be terribly grand, much grander than being called Lady Murray. I hate it, this sort of knowledge. I can't help it. I know this. It remained with her, not only as something she couldn't help knowing and introduced for comic effect in her writings, it remained, too, in her oft-noted elegance of bearing and speech, which left her effortlessly at ease in Oxford society. And this brings me to one final effect of her insider status. That is, that she did a vital, if unremarked, service simply in being Anscombe's friend. Apart from being in a minority as a woman, no one could have fitted into Oxford society more easily than Foote. Foote alone was eventually invited round to Austin's Saturday morning kindergarten. Without Foote as her friend and champion, it is easy to imagine someone like Anscombe with her duffel coat and trousers and her cigars and her Catholicism and her seven kids helping raise one another under the disapproving stares of some of the St. John Street neighbors. It is so easy to imagine her being completely isolated in Oxford, notwithstanding her brilliance. But if Foote venerated her and everyone loved Foote, well then. I turn in closing to Midgley. A principal interest of mine in this talk, as you've picked up, has been in the ways that outsiders were especially well positioned to make key contributions to a revolution in our thinking about ethics. And Midgley was as much an outsider as Murdoch or Anscombe. She's often overlooked even by scholars who note the biographical connections and synergies between Anscombe, Foote, and Murdoch. And I'm so glad that the Institute has insisted on discussing the four of them together this year. A number of factors have converged to keep Midgley's work from being discussed alongside that of her friends. There's first the unusual shape of her career. Anscombe, Foote, and Murdoch had all taken posts at Oxford by the end of 1948. Midgley was briefly at Reading, just a couple of years, before marrying and resigning that post. She didn't begin lecturing again at Newcastle until the mid-60s, pausing first to raise her three boys. Or again, consider their publication histories. By the mid-60s, Anscombe had brought out most of the works for which she's famous. Foote had established herself as Hare's leading critic, and Murdoch was turning away from philosophy toward fiction. Meanwhile, the first of Midgley's more than dozen books was still over a decade off, published when she was 59. It's been easy to overlook the generational tie between Midgley and her university friends. The character of her work has likewise kept it from being discussed alongside theirs. Every bit as eclectic in her interests as Murdoch, and liberated from any professional pressure to concentrate her reading in a single discipline, she began in her 30s to read extensively in the emerging field of ethology, animal behavior, as well as literary criticism, intellectual history, politics, and more. She became convinced that moral philosophers must relate various bodies of knowledge to one another if they are ever to achieve an adequate understanding of human life, human motivation, and thereby human success or failure. There was distinguished precedent for this kind of work, and Midgley and her friends all knew it. This is roughly how Aristotle approaches ethics. As a biologist, studying an animal of especially absorbing interest, exploring not only how this animal behaves and why, but also what challenges are set to this animal by its nature. This had become extremely uncommon, though, in the professionalized, one is tempted to say scholastic, environment of the mid-20th century. A few years after joining the department at Newcastle, one of Midgley's colleagues urged her to offer an evening course on animal behavior and ethics through the university's adult education program. It was the pivot of her career. In teaching these students of varying ages and backgrounds, all of whom were enrolled simply because they were interested, Midgley began to work out a biologically grounded framework for talking about human nature and motivation, a framework she'd been seeking since the beginning 
of the 1950s. Writing to her BBC producer in 1951, with a one-year-old crawling around the carpet uh, at her feet, she'd identified her great theme, quote, the many-sidedness of human nature and the inadequacy of all current official ways of regarding it, end quote. Now, in the space of a few years, she brought out her first scholarly articles, culminating in The Concept of Beastliness in 1973. That piece caught the attention of Max Black at Cornell and led to an invitation first to come to the States as a visiting scholar and then to expand her reflections on ethology and ethics into her first and I think most important book, Beast and Man, original title, Beastliness. The book begins with an appeal to think more carefully about the likenesses and unlikenesses between humans and other animals and to scrutinize the language in which we express these. The Western tradition has often been fearful or disgusted at our animality. But given that, quote, we are not just rather like animals, we are animals, this will leave us with a misleading sense of ourselves. To think about our lives is to think about our nature, and this can't be understood in isolation from biology. By Midgley's own testimony, the heart of the book is its 11th chapter. In that chapter, on being animal as well as rational, Midgley offers an account inspired by Darwin and contemporary ethologists of the place of reason in human life. The details are complex, but the overall point is straightforward. Our evolutionary history has bequeathed to us a generous assortment of motives. It has, moreover, bequeathed to us conceptual and imaginative capacities that ramify the conflicts that would occur anyway between our diverse motives. We are distinctive in our ability to anticipate and fret over our conflicting motives, or even to think or imagine our way into new conflicts. Any animal with a nature this complex and conflictual requires a means of organizing and directing its behavior, that is, of prioritizing and harmonizing its motives. For many animals, this is achieved by the operation of relatively simple, highly specified instincts. In her later book, Wickedness, Midgley offers the example of geese, who hatch one group of young after another all summer long, but fly away, leaving their last brood to perish, when something, the temperature, the angle of the light, triggers their migratory instinct. For humans, though, the same faculty that aggravates internal conflicts by allowing us to anticipate or even generate them also enables us to deal with them, to conceive, try out, and criticize approaches to living as whole and integrated beings. Midgley's ethics is an ethics of self-integration. Anscombe, Foote, and Murdoch had all recommended a retrieval of a biologically grounded way of thinking and talking about ethics. We need a return, they argued, to the conceptual vocabulary of virtue and vice, which would be grounded in an account of what enables humans to flourish in the performance of characteristically human pursuits. But all of their work, I think we have to say, was essentially promissory. Midgley, writing from the margins of the discipline and not really appreciated by any of her friends, save Murdoch, was the first to present a serious proposal for a naturalistic ethics of the kind recommended but not developed by the others. Indeed, she was the only one of them who could, as she was the only one who knew enough biology and enough moral philosophy to try to relate to the two fields. Whatever one judges about the details of her view, it clearly represents what it would mean to bring to completion the revolution initiated by Murdoch, Anscombe, and Foote. I must draw to a close. There's so much more I'd like to say, but that's what conversation can be for. I'll just remark one last thing. It seems to me that contemporary philosophers, contemporary Westerners in general, remain very much in the grip of the ideas Murdoch, Anscombe, Foote, and Midgley attacked and worked to transcend. I could cite as examples the theories of some of the most important moral philosophers writing today, Christine Korsgaard, for instance. Her theory of self-constitution bristles with insights. It's also, in crucial respects, existentialist. But let me give a homelier example of the cultural infusion of these ideas. Each of my children has come home from primary school with a language arts worksheet that's really a lesson in positivist value theory, an exercise in distinguishing facts from opinions. 
Never mind that one might have opinions about factual matters. The examples make plain enough that it's the fact-value dichotomy at work. The examples of opinions are all judgments of good and bad, better and worse. To think that one design or policy or person or artifact is superior to another is perforce to have an opinion. And that's to be sharply distinguished from any fact. In a linguistic and cultural context in which fact is a loose synonym for reality, this is a little lesson for the children in moral subjectivism. Think again of what Foote wanted to find the words and the concepts to be able to say that the Nazis were wrong. Well, my children are given to understand that may be her opinion, but it can't be a fact. But Foote and Anscombe and Murdoch and Midgley were right, and the curriculum authors are wrong. It is possible to reframe our thinking about these matters and see how it could be a fact that the Nazis were wrong and that racialized disparities in criminal sentencing are wrong and that the sexual molestation of children is wrong and a hundred other things. Anscombe's mentor Wittgenstein wrote, quote, a picture held us captive. The picture of the fact value dichotomy still holds us captive. The ongoing significance of the four insider outsiders I've told you about lies in the way they refused to accept that picture and in its place drew another. Thank you.